Blood. Blood is a liquid connective tissue that makes up the transport medium of the cardiovascular system. Its two main functions are to transport nutrients and oxygen to the cells and carry carbon dioxide and other waste materials away from the cells. Blood also transfers heat to the body surface and plays a major role in defending the body against disease. So let's first look at the composition of blood. It is made of liquid medium and blood solids. The liquid is about 55% of the blood and that liquid is called plasma. And the solid makes up 45%, that is red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. A healthy adult contains about four to five liters of blood. So let's look at plasma first. Plasma is the liquid medium. It is a sticky straw colored fluid. You can see there um, that somebody's donated plasma. It is 90% water. Our nourishment for cells is dissolved in the plasma and the nourishment includes vitamins, amino acids, and glucose. The plasma also carries hormones, waste, and proteins. Two examples of proteins that are in the plasma are albumin. Albumin is a protein that's important to regulating osmotic pressure. And antibodies are proteins that help fight disease. The first solid blood particle are called red blood cells. Their proper name are called erythrocytes. These are the cells that transport the oxygen to your body cells. Red blood cells are formed in your red bone marrow. They make a large amount of an iron containing protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the molecule that actually transports the oxygen. Now hemoglobin is actually composed of four polypeptide chains. So here is the hemoglobin molecule. It consists of four polypeptide chains. You see one in orange, green, red, and purple. And then you see here is the, uh, the iron, ooh, my Bluetooth isn't working so well, the iron uh, atom. There's one in each polypeptide chain. There's one here, 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 and here. So for each hemoglobin molecule, there are four polypeptide chains and each polypeptide chain contains one iron atom. And the iron is what actually transports the oxygen molecule. During the formation of the red blood cells, the nucleus and the organelles disintegrate. Remember when new cells are formed, they contain the nucleus and all of the organelles. But one of the things that I taught you last year is that form follows function. Oh, bad hair day. Form follows function. So if the function of red blood cells is to transport oxygen, the red blood cells don't need a nucleus or organelles to do that, so they disintegrate. The reason why they disintegrate is because then they have more room to produce more hemoglobin. So if you have a nucleus and organelles, you've got a lot of the volume of your cell that's filled up with all of that rather than hemoglobin. The red blood cells don't need to produce energy, so you don't need mitochondria. They're not making proteins, so you don't need endoplasmic reticulum. They're not exporting anything, so you don't need the Golgi body, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't need any of that stuff, then might as well get rid of it, fill up that extra space with hemoglobin because that's ultimately what the point of your existence is. It's just to transport oxygen and you do that through the protein of hemoglobin. Red blood cells last between 120 to 130 days. And at any given time, you have about 30 trillion in your body. Two million red blood cells disintegrate every second, but they are formed at the same rate. So imagine your body producing just red blood cells, never mind skin cells, muscle cells, whatever other cells need to be replaced in your body, two million red blood cells are replaced every second. White blood cells are called leukocytes. So red blood cells, erythrocytes, white blood cells, leukocytes. Leukocytes help defend your body against disease. They are also formed in your red bone marrow, but some of them go to other organs to mature, like your lymph nodes and your spleen. 
They are larger than erythrocytes and they are fewer in number, which means you've got tons and tons of red blood cells. You don't have as many white blood cells. In a cubic millimeter of blood, that would be maybe about one drop of blood, you'll have 4 million red blood cells and only 7,000 white blood cells. And white blood cells can squeeze through the openings in the walls of the blood vessels because they have what's called a globular shape. They can basically, like an amoeba, they can squish themselves between um, the walls between your blood vessels and your body tissues because they need to be able to get anywhere in your body where there is an infection or where there's a possible pathogen. So this is a picture of a white blood cell that's in the process of engulfing a microorganism. Here under the microscope, you can see a white cell, the large shapeless body in the middle surrounded by red corpuscles. It's about to engulf that long thin body, which is an invading bacteria. Watch. If there's a large scale invasion, we may need antibiotics, but our white cells give us a great deal of protection. Okay, so just a quick comparison of red blood cells versus white blood cells. Red blood cells are bi biconcave in shape. They have a smooth surface. They are short-lived, they only live a few months, and there's only one type of red blood cells, red blood cell. White blood cells, on the other hand, are irregular in shape and they have a rough surface. They are long-lasting, they last for many years, and there are several types. So what are the types of white blood cells? There is a, a whole list of different ones, I'm not going to get into it because you can learn about that. Um, in university, like eosinophils and basal, basophils and stuff like that, based on the kind of enzyme that they contain. But I can break down a couple of basic types for you. So one of the really major parts of your, um, your defense against pathogen includes having white blood cells that their job is to kind of patrol through your circulatory system, through your blood, and anytime they come across something which cannot be identified as a self cell, um, one of the things that we learned, uh, did I teach you about that already? I think so. When you look at the cell membrane and there's like uh, proteins and carbohydrates on the surface of your cells, they're there to identify those cells as self cells. So like they belong to you. Obviously, if you get invaded by a virus or bacteria or something, they don't have those identifying markers on them. So that's how your white blood cells are able to identify what belongs and what doesn't belong. So a phagocyte is one type of white blood cell, which their job is to engulf invading microorganisms. So anything that doesn't belong is going to be identified by a phagocyte and it's going to be engulfed and destroyed. Another type of white blood cell, which is not a phagocyte, uh, which you'll learn about in the chapter on the immune system, they're called B cells. Uh, they produce antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that help destroy substances, particularly viruses, because viruses can't reproduce unless they attach to your cell and insert their DNA into your cell. Basically, they act like an alien. Uh, it's like, um, what do they call that? Invasion of the body snatchers, where the alien basically takes over the host cell and makes your cell produce viral protein for it. Um, so if a virus can't attach to your cell, it can't insert its DNA and it can't reproduce. So antibodies are part of the protein defense against allowing a virus to attach to your cell. Antibodies are also a big... Um, a big method that we use to test for the presence of viruses, for example, coronavirus. When you have a coronavirus test, especially when they do a blood serum test, not the nasal swab, um, although I'm not really sure if the nasal swab also, I don't think that's an antibody test. I'm not sure exactly what they're testing for when they do the nasal swab, but um, when I know when they take blood and they test for it that way, they're looking for antibodies. If you're producing antibodies against the coronavirus, that means that you're infected with coronavirus. So um, 
Right. So when you have an infection, the number of white blood cells that you have in your body can double. So here you're looking at a collection of bacterial cells. This is a phagocyte and you can see how the, sh the shape of the phagocyte changes and it co completely surrounds the whole group of bacteria. That's called phagocytism. Last year, we learned about um, endocytosis. This is part of endocytosis. When you surround something with your cell and you engulf it. And then once it's engulfed by the white blood cell, the white blood cell will um, have vesicles inside that contain enzymes and it will slowly break down these bacterial cells and any of the proteins or whatever can be um, reused. So here's another video where they have, um, they've labeled, I think enzyme with a green probe. A lot of times we use um, radioactive probes so that we can track, uh, we can track where things go. Kind of like when we looked at the Hershey Chase experiment at the end of last year, when they labeled um, the DNA with, I think, phosphorus and the protein with sulfur or the other way around, and they can track where the protein goes, where the, where the DNA goes. Okay, the last part of the blood solids are called platelets. Platelets are essential to the formation of a blood clot. A blood clot is a mass of interwoven fibers and blood cells that prevents excess blood loss. Platelets are not whole cells. They do not have a nucleus and they only last about a week, a week and a half. So how does a blood clot form? When a blood vessel is damaged, Platelets are going to gather together at the damaged site and they're going to stick together to form a small plug at the site of the damage. The vessels around the damaged plus the damage, oh my God. The vessels constrict around the damaged area. The reason why they constrict is to slow blood flow so that you don't bleed to death. The platelets are going to release special clotting factors and the clotting factors are going to trigger a series of chemical reactions. And the end product of those reactions is a protein called fibrin, which you see in the top right corner, it looks like those green, greenish brown stringy things. And in the bottom right hand corner, it's these brown, these brown strings. Fibrin are very sticky, long protein chains. And this forms a net to trap red blood cells. Eventually, if this occurs on the outside of the body, eventually that will, the blood clot will harden to form a scab. And the reason why it's important to leave scabs alone, and I know, I don't know if any of you guys are like huge scab pickers, I can't help myself if I have a scab, I have to pick it. It's important to try to leave it alone because underneath that scab is very, very vulnerable new skin being formed. And if you continuously pick the scab and you like start to bleed again, you're damaging all the repair that your body's trying to do. And eventually you're going to end up with scar tissue because you've damaged the tissue over and over and over again by peeling back that scab. Instead of just letting the scab, the scab is there as a, like a hard shield to protect these delicate layers underneath that are being repaired and reformed. Um, and so then eventually when the tissue is completely repaired, then the scab will fall off. So it's important to try to just leave it alone and let your body heal itself. Even under physiological conditions, a small tear can appear in the wall of a blood vessel in order to prevent blood loss platelets and coagulation factors such as the pivotal factor 10 acting in a coordinated manner close this wound the platelets are responsible for a first sealing of the tear then a number of coagulation factors are activated leading to the formation of fibrin strands which stabilize the growing clot These processes can also be triggered inappropriately 
and play a major role in the pathology of ACS, VTE, and AF. Thromboembolic disorders can affect both types of blood vessels. Arterial or white clots are primarily triggered by the rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque. Arterial clots are platelet-rich. Or red clots, on the other hand, mainly consist of red blood cells and fibrin. Vascular injury, hypercoagulability of the blood and venous stasis play a crucial role in their development. It's important to note that the formation of both types of clots, arterial and venous, always involves platelets as well as coagulation factors. Okay, so now that we know what blood is composed of, we can talk about blood types. Blood type is determined by the type of antigen present on the surface of a red blood cell. Now an antigen is a protein or a carbohydrate that acts as a signal, letting the body recognize foreign substances. If antigens that are normally present on your cells, there is no response by your immune system. But if there are antigens that are not normally present on your cell, your body will produce antibody. So antigen is actually short for antibody generating substance. So it's basically just like you, you have antigens on your cells, but that's what I'm saying. That was what I was saying before about having like these markers to identify what belongs to your body and what doesn't. All right. So in the 1900s, the scientist who started discovering that there were different types of blood is called Carl Landsteiner. Um, he discovered uh, these different types of blood because he just started mixing blood types together. So he, because in the, the original reason why he wanted to do this, he doesn't just like, he's not some psycho that's just like, I'm just gonna start mixing blood types. Um, he actually wanted to know why um, back in the 1900s, they gave blood transfusion where you give blood from one person, you give it to another, why sometimes it caused problems and sometimes it didn't. So he would mix two different blood samples together. And then he started noticing that there was clotting. Remember I talked about clotting before. So when you have, um, a cut or a scrape on the outside of your skin and you start to bleed, the blood clot eventually leads to the formation of a scab. But when it happens inside of your body, the problem is that the blood clot could come loose and travel through the bloodstream and having like a little uh, clump of blood cells and antibodies uh, stuck together, traveling through your blood, it can cause blockages of smaller blood vessels and even worse, if it gets into the brain and causes a blockage there, I talked about in the previous videos about heart attacks and strokes, it's generally not good to have clumps of anything in your bloodstream. So sometimes he saw when he mixed blood samples together, there was clotting and sometimes there was no clotting. So his observations led to the modern classification that are, is based on three antigens. Remember, antigen stands for an antibody generating substance. The three antigens are A, B, and RH. In 1901, Carl Lundsteiner discovered that centuries of attempted blood transfusions had failed because practitioners had overlooked one simple factor, that blood falls into distinct groups. The Viennese pathologist discovered different types of protein and sugar markers, known as antigens, on the surface of people's red blood cells. He realized that blood transfusions between people with different types of antigens failed because the body's immune system would attack the foreign red blood cells. For example, if a person with antigen A on their blood cells is given a transfusion of antigen B blood cells, antibodies in their blood plasma will destroy the donated blood cells triggering a dangerous reaction. In 1902, Lundsteiner classified human blood into the now well-known A, B, AB, and O groups, allowing safe blood transfusion on a mass scale. Today, around 107 million units of blood donations are collected globally every year. 
demonstrating the huge impact of Lunchtana's discovery. In 1930, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Characteristic of his energetic and hardworking nature, Lunchtana died pipette in hand in June 1943, after suffering a heart attack in his laboratory at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. Okay, so let me try to explain how this works. Let me get my pen. Okay, so we know that there are four blood types. There's actually eight, but I'm not talking about the RH factor yet. And I'm pretty sure if you guys know what blood type you are, you know, you know whether you have the A or B or both antigen or neither, um, but you don't know about your RH factor. And that's just as important. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. If you're blood type A, your red blood cells have antigen A on the surface of them. That's how your body recognizes it. If you have antigen A, your body's like, oh yeah, okay, I get that. But the antibodies that your body produces are anti-B antibodies. So that means that you can get blood from type O, which has no antibody or antigens, and you can get blood from type A. You can give blood to type A and type AB. If you're type B, you have the B antigen on your red blood cells. So your body recognizes B, but it does not recognize antigen A. And so it will produce anti-A antibodies. You can get blood from type O and type B, and you can give blood to type B and type AB. If you're type AB, you have both the A and B antigen on your red blood cells. You do not produce any antibodies. You can get blood from anyone, but you can only give blood to AB because you contain both antigens. If you're type O, you do not have, I, you have neither A nor B antigen. You produce anti-A and anti-B antibodies. You can only get blood from type O, but you're considered the universal donor. You can give blood to type A, type B, type, type AB, and O. Type AB is considered the universal recipient because you can receive any kind of blood. Type O, the universal donor. This is why um, in any medical shows and you see that there's like a big emergency, they always call for O neg. They're like, I need like five units of O neg stat. Um, o neg stands for O negative. The negative part is the RH factor, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, which like I said, is just as important as knowing which A or B type you are. But the reason why they ask for O negative is because that has zero antigens and that could literally be given to anybody. They do that if there's an emergency and somebody needs um, immediately um, a blood transfusion and they don't have time to type the person's blood yet. They will just give them O negative because O negative is safe for everybody. Uh, I'm gonna skip this for now because I wanna talk about the RH factor. And then I'll go back to that, that question. Okay, so remember there were three antigens that Landsteiner discovered. There was an A antigen, B antigen, and RH factor. The RH factor is present in about 85% of the human population. It is named after the rhesus monkey in which it was first discovered. So that's where the RH comes from. You are either RH positive, which means that the antigen is present, or you are RH negative, which means it is not present. So if we go back to this table, we not only have these four blood types, we have eight, because you are either A positive or A negative, B positive or B negative, AB positive or AB negative, and O positive or O, or o negative. So the positive negative is another uh, aspect that you have to look at in donating blood. So for example, I am A positive. It is very important that you know whether you are positive or negative because I'm A, B po or sorry, I'm A positive, which means that I can get blood from O positive, O negative, A positive, and A negative. 
if I was A negative, I would only be able to get blood from O negative and A negative because this positive represents the presence of the RH factor. If I am whatever negative and I'm given O positive blood, my body will react to the positive because I am negative. So it's really, really important that you understand not only your ABO system type, but also your RH factor. I would highly recommend um, if you uh, are able to, if you go to your doctor, you ask your parents or whatever, it should be on your birth certificate maybe, um, that you understand whether you're positive or negative. It's really important to know that. Okay, so two babies are believed to have been switched at birth. Blood samples were taken from each of the parents and babies. The following results were obtained from the blood samples. For family number one, mother is type B, father is type O, and the baby is type A. For family two, the mother is type O, the father is type A, and the baby is type O. Were the babies switched at birth? So you have to identify the fact that mom is type B, father has none, neither the A nor the B. I'm not taking into account the RH factor here, but the baby is type A. So is there any situation in which a father who doesn't have antigens and a mother who has the B antigen can have a baby that has the A antigen? No way, no how. This baby is type O, which means it doesn't have any antigen. This baby is type A, which means it has the A. These babies were switched at birth. Now you might think, how can a mother that's type B and a father that's type O have a baby that's type O? And that's really easy if we go back to Mendel. Because blood type is, um, what do you call that? Blood type is a, a characteristic that's controlled by a gene. Genes are controlled by two alleles. So if this baby type O, let's just say they switched them back so the baby's type O and you're like, how is that possible? So if the father type is O, we say he's got this blood type. So both alleles have to be O because if even one allele was either A or B, he would be type A or B. Now, in order for them to have a type O baby, that means mom has to be heterozygous. She has to have one allele for the B type and one allele for the O type because otherwise there's no way they can have a type O baby. In this case, this allele would combine with either one of these and produce a type O child. If this allele combines with one of these, then they'll have a B type baby. The most serious problems happen with blood type during pregnancy. If the mother is RH negative and the father is RH positive, the child may inherit the RH factor and be RH positive. This is not a problem for the first birth. It's a problem for the second birth because natural childbirth is messy. It's bloody. Usually the moms poop because they're pushing so hard that they just, they poop on the table. Um, you can't help that during natural childbirth when the, when the baby is pushed out through the vagina. That's just, that's nature, that's what happens. So during childbirth, because there's blood involved, a small amount of the baby's blood may reach the mom's bloodstream. So if that happens because mom is RH negative and the baby's RH positive, mom is going to develop antibodies Again, not a problem for child number one. It's a, it's a problem if she gets pregnant again with another RH positive uh, fetus because she has antibodies against the RH factor, her immune system will attack the fetus while she's pregnant. That's called erythroblastosis fetalis. The fetus can die, but if it doesn't die, after it's born, it will need an immediate transfusion. To prevent this from happening, the RH negative mom can be given antibodies to destroy the RH positive cells that have entered her bloodstream. So she becomes immune before her body develops its own antibodies. <laughs> 